Hi, and welcome to the Play Creators Conference. Um, thanks for joining us for this session about voice tech, and I'm delighted to introduce the panel. So we have TJ Morrison, um, the studio head of SoSound. We have Zay Ortiz, uh, co-founder of Vizric, Vizric <laughs> Games, excuse me, and Lucy Gill, the product manager at Night Zookeeper. So I'm gonna ask everybody maybe just to introduce yourself very briefly, just give us a little bit of your background and your current role, and then we can get into the panel discussion. So maybe TJ, um, I'll, cool. I'll ask you to kick off. Awesome, yeah. Um, yeah, so, I'm TJ. Um, I work for my family uh, business, SoSound, uh, and my role is as an inventor. Uh, SoSound has kind of serviced the toy industry uh, since, as SoSound since 2003. Um, we kicked off as a kind of um, uh, an, an audio and technology company specifically focusing on those areas. Um, and in more recent years, we've massively dived in uh, to invention and uh, more recently than that even we're doing a lot of uh, product design consultancy uh, for the toy industry great thank you uh, Zay can I ask you to introduce yourself please and yes. where, what you're at today of course my name is Zay Ortiz and I am co-founder of Versix Games with Nolan Bushnell and we basically make uh, interactive voice games uh, one of our games that we released in late 2019 was a game called Saint Noir. It was our first to market, and we were exploring the, the voice community and um, making sure that we can trigger different um, algorithms of branching narrative so we could change the voices. Uh, storytelling is a big part of us. Uh, my background is in film and television and really wanted to get into the space to explore. Uh, as most people are very somewhat years new into the industry and had another career before getting into voice, I come from uh, uh, a place of entertainment and wanted to bring entertainment into voice. I think it was a nice fit because I come from animation and visual background and to go into a place where it's more audible and uh, listening to, I truly want to really bring beyond what Versix can do and also the community to bring visuals to it. And I can't wait to see that happen at, at some point. Great, thank you. Lucy. Thank you. Hi, um, so I am product manager at Night Zookeeper. Um, I joined them in January, so it's a reasonably new role. Um, my background is in uh, technology for children. Um, and um, I've looked at the subject of voice a few times with clients. I used to work very much as a consultant. Um, and so I guess uh, moving into Night Zookeeper, which is a brand that's about creative writing and literacy for children, um, I think there's a really good opportunity to encourage creative writing and creativity in children through voice. So that's something we're starting to explore a bit more as a brand. Great, thank you. Um, so just from our my own background, I'm actually an engineer. Um, I'm a PhD in speech recognition, over 20 years experience in voice technology. And um, I'm the founder and executive chair of Soapbox Lab. So we build voice tech for kids that it's, we license to third parties to integrate into their products and services. So that's me. I'll leave it at that for my part. Um, so it's kind of interesting. We've all got very different perspectives. Um, it's all around kids, but very much education, games, and, and then in the, the toy and digital toy design as well. So it's quite interesting. But one thing I think we can all agree on is that there has been a huge movement of voice technology in the adult space, right? Alexa, Google Home, broke it open. It's on our phones, it's in our kitchens. And our kids are playing and interacting with these devices. But when we actually look at products that have been designed for kids, there's very little out Sorry, there. I don't know that one. Sorry, we have Alexa here in the room. I shouldn't have said <laughs> that very loud. <laughs> but realistically, it's still quite shocking to me. I found a soapbox lab in 2013 and I was full sure by 2021 this area would be rife with, with, with innovation and new products. And I'd love to ask you, because all of you guys have, you know, products and working on products in the industry, but you all have experience in voice tech. Um, and I'd love to ask each of you, why do you think there's been such, um, it's starting and we know it's there, but it's nowhere near where we would have thought probably by 2021. And I'd love to ask probably from your own experience, you know, what was your experience working with voice tech and why do you think the industry isn't as far along as it probably should be? We would have expected. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll start again with you, TJ, and then we'll mix it up later. <laughs> sure. 
Um, yeah, I think definitely from sort of, yeah, I've got uh, lots of nieces and nephews, so I, I've kind of seen them interact with Alexa and, and Google Home and, and Siri and various others. And I've always kind of seen them get quite frustrated that Alexa doesn't necessarily understand them, especially the, the kind of younger preschoolers. Um, so I think there's definitely been a potential barrier there for, for, for R&D. I know that obviously Alexa and Google and, and, and Apple and everyone else, they're all um, you know, striving to improve that technology always. And I think that perhaps there's been a slightly um, slower kind of um, opportunity to, for, for, for voice tech in those devices to work with children uh, because of that. Um, uh, big because of the fact that it's so popular for adults um, and they, they do really, really well with, with product. Um, and it, it feels like it's almost a, a, a chicken and an egg situation where it's like, I guess they're kind of demanding really compelling stuff from com from invention studios, from, um, from toy companies. And if they're not receiving that product, then why are they going to invest so much in, you know, making it better for kids? Um, and, and also just the fact that Amazon obviously are, you know, Amazon and, and the others um, are all kind of trying to get everyone involved. And maybe the, the kind of kids market is smaller than than what they're necessarily targeting at the moment. Um, that said, I think that there's also um, a lot of uh, upfront investment that is required from um, toy companies specifically um, in terms of like the R&D budgets and so on to explore this technology. And, um, and I think that, that that has also been a barrier again, because it, it, it just needs one of them to, to have a product that really takes off, especially one that's, you know, mass market in terms of price point as well, that, you know, people can have at home. Um, and I think if, if, if that happens, when that happens, because it will, it's inevitable, the technology is improving all the time. And with, you know, companies like, like yourselves at, at Soapbox, it's just gonna keep improving. There's gonna be more opportunities. Um, when it happens, I think that there'll be kind of an explosion of, of, of items on the, on the market, which, which will, uh, be successful. Yeah. Agreed. Um, Zay, you're, you, you integrated, you were one of the first to integrate voice into, uh, into games, you know, what was your experience and, and, and did your experience lead you to understand a little bit what, what has been the slowness in adoption or are you still? Oh, <laughs> no, uh, we, it was a huge learning curve for everyone on my team because we, there were, there is a discouragement of not knowing you're, you're entering the unknown and entering the unknown, especially when you haven't done it before you, you have to explore uh, uncharted territory and to find those answers are not very easy. You, you ask others and um, you know, they're, at the time, there wasn't a lot of tutorials. Now, the benefit is, is that a lot of companies have learning tools to get you jump started into it. At the time when we were exploring it, we were having a hard time finding that. I think it's just going to get easier that way, especially uh, larger companies being able to uh, afford to teach other people to adopt them onto their platforms. That is, that's a key. Um, I wish we had that when we started out. That, that's really important. I mean, one of the things that we had to do, we had to just rough and tumble, just explore and feel it out. And we worked, we teamed up with Amazon and a lot of the questions that we had, we were kind of working with them. A lot of the stuff that weren't uh, functional, you know, we had dreams of how we wanted to make our game you know if there was no we had no constraints on us because we didn't know what voice was at the time and so there was a beauty to that and also a reality to that where when we found out that we couldn't do something right now i believe that we will it just hasn't been built yet there were certain things that we wanted um and those are those are things that you have to be really creative and work around. And we did, we worked around all those things that we couldn't do now and still want to do them in the future. And one of the things that we found um, is, you know, for, for larger companies, we're, we're pretty small and we, we did the best we can. And what we found out is that we were able to make our first game under six months. And a lot of people were surprised by that. They thought it would take longer to do that because of the R&D process and some other stuff and the learning curve. 
And I think when you don't put constraints on yourself, you're able to really plow through something with the team and magic happens. And so when you start adopting, you know, I, I learned this in the film industry when I was in the film industry, you get a little bit complacent. You, you get kind of used to it and then you you don't break the mold. And one of the beauty of voice is that you're able to break the mold and able to do different things there. Mm -hmm. There's so many avenues that you can explore uh, as the tools keep on growing. Um, yeah, I like that. I, I I think, that yeah, I, I think it's an amazing opportunity. I, I wish that I saw more adoption and I, mm -hmm. the conversation that was happening. I thought I would see more of that for sure. And one of the things that I think that it hasn't happened because we've tested it is cost, you know, um, you know, doing voice with a product is very expensive because the product you need inventory and the voice part, you're not really capitalizing as much on that. You're making money on the product side. So you're technically making two products for us in the gaming industry, because we, we making board games, card games, products that interact with, with voice. So you're, you have two products that you're making, but you're selling it as one. Mm. So it yeah, becomes very cool. expensive, you know, and, yeah. and I don't think a lot of people realize that. that, that and was that, do you think, do you think, uh, Zay, that was because the, you know, Amazon, Alexa wasn't ready for you then you, you actually were kind of, it was a very slow process. If, if the documentation was better, if, if the SDKs were there, you could have plugged, yes. in, if you could have plugged and played, you would have had a, a much lower investment to have made. Oh, like, so if the industry, definitely. so if the industry advances, that price point can come down, that like your, your investment, your down. investment comes down. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yes. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. That's interesting. If those tools were there. I mean, we wrote the code yeah. raw. I mean, it yeah, was, yeah, 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 yeah. So. That was a big investment. Yeah, you, yeah yes. going in early. And it's true, though, going in early into anything when when it's so raw, you know, as the, as it matures, then then, you know, people people who are providing the services yeah. like ourselves, we've already learned our mistakes and hopefully you guys have a better experience as, yes. as time evolves, yes. you know. Yeah. Lucy, um, on your on your side, what you know, you're on the education side, which I think is, is quite interesting. Um, you you have doubled in the voice tech. Do you have any insights into in your experience for the last couple of years, not just a, a, about why it's been so slow based on your yeah. experience? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think it's fascinating because as you say, it is one of those things that I just expected to take off quicker. You know, when I was talking about mm. this a few years ago, I, you know, I was expecting uh, to have escalated quicker and, and it is coming, but I think there's an awful lot of fear when you work in the children's space all you need, and I'm, I'm working in a startup at the moment, I've worked in all sorts of different types of companies in the past, but there's this inherent fear um, in the voice space of something where there is this potential risk, child safety risk that, you know, they're recording voices. So there's fear amongst the potential audience. So parents are a bit nervous about it, but so are the companies. They're worried they're gonna mess up and do something wrong. And I think whenever you're going already, um, uh, into the unknown in the sense that it's something you haven't worked in before and there's no proven um, example there's no like mass market Alexa sort of solution that's been you know everyone's saying oh well obviously this worked which gives everyone the confidence and I think mm. it will snowball when one person gets it right I think yeah. and it's really mass market every child has to have it suddenly it'll snowball and the risk so when I'm having conversations internally about these things um, we, we talk about building more voice into a product and and the potential advantages of that lots of people can see the advantages but um as they said it i think there is the risk that it's going to cost even more which for a startup you're like well we're trying to minimize cost we can maybe maybe we can just rip that voice bit out that'll save us a bit of cost you know those kinds of conversations genuinely happen um that as well as this potential risk um and i also think from my other experience the user experience is really really important for voice I've done user testing with prototype voice products and very small things can make a huge difference to whether or not the experience actually works for the kids. And mm. people often expect too much, particularly at the younger end of the market, if you're pitching this as a preschooler, they really struggle at a certain age to listen and take in information audibly. Well, in fact, they struggle with instructions generally. And when they're using a tablet or something, they just keep tapping and, and they kind of mm. figure it out. But with voice, they tend to just wander off. <laughs> so you do use, use testing, you're like, 
I, I think I think we lost that three-year-old. Yeah, yeah. And actually, it doesn't mean you can't do it. It absolutely means you, you know, there's loads and loads yeah. of opportunity. But I think all you need is to have sat in a user research session with that and seen it go wrong to go, oh no, voice doesn't work. And you do that's the sort of thing you hear that puts people off. So the, the combination of those things, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean the potential for it to be so more engaging than a passive app or exactly. a toy. But that's a huge point because there are very few people out there who've got experience in voice UX. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's such a burgeoning area that like, no, I think everybody here on this call has been learning over the last few years. Like there's nobody who's got like 10 years experience in this, like, no, a very few in the world anyway. Yeah. So this is well, something we learn. And it can't just be a case of I'm just going to shove voice into this product. It needs yeah. to be designed into it. And, you know, the idea of a well products can be plug and play they can be up you should be able to be up and running in in a few two days but as long as you have really thought through the process of voice how uh, voice integrates into a product absolutely yeah. and i was quite pleasantly surprised the way we uh, the night zookeeper one that you referred to um actually was built uh, in conjunction with amazon so they they kind of helped us do that so the development was done by them um, and actually, it's been much easier in a way than we expected. And I would absolutely encourage other people to just try these things. It hasn't been yeah. expensive and it hasn't been time consuming. And it's we haven't got it right. Perfect. You know, I think there's, you know, I look at it and go, wow, that's brilliant. You know, that's a first draft. Yeah. But it's out there. It's live. It's sitting on Alexa and kids can have a play and we can now do loads of research on it. And it hasn't taken us a lot of time. So I really do think people need to give it a shot uh, and just- Yeah, they've it. all evolved. Yeah, I, I do think like, yeah, it depends on when you got into this game. I mean, it's this whole area is new, relatively yeah. speaking to the, you know, even educational app industry, you know, it's, it's yeah, very yeah. new. You touched on something else there that I think is worth mentioning when it comes to toys. And then in my own experience, and one of the reasons I started Soapbox was around the concern. The concern that people have about the data, their ch we're all, we always think one thing about ourselves when, when it comes to our kids, we, we think differently. Um, and, and one of the you know things that we saw back in the early days was that concern. I mean, I think most of us here will remember the, the, the Mattel Barbie um, that, you know, that was a, a disaster and was pulled from the market and there was all these things. But in actual fact, they were COPPA compliant. You know, they were doing everything right. They were getting the consent and they were sending the data. They were doing everything right, but it was pre-Alexa. So that, that, I think a year later, everybody was sticking Alexa in their bedrooms and their, their kitchens and it was fine, but like Mattel got in on the wrong side of it. But there is potential here to come back and this is one of the ones I'm wondering about is our comfort levels when it comes to our kids if we were to put it all on device right so if no data was to leave the device uh, so it's on an SDK on a you know on a, a phone or a tablet or it's a little chip in the center of the plastic you know components in a game would that help if we have the accuracy thing sorted and it's actually working for kids would that would you guys see that having moved the market say in your experience with the game do you think that would move the needle a bit i mean or? what you were just saying right now is things that we wanted to explore and try to look into and talk to a lot of vendors about and i think we we want to because even that alone if it's going to work or not we don't know but we feel like that is a particular way to go uh, especially with games, because it's a little bit more isolated. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit more control there. And the biggest part is it's one unit. That's yeah. the biggest Out part. of the box. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the learning curve is like, okay, you have this product. Now you have to talk to a device in your kitchen or in your bedroom. That becomes, it, it, to someone thinking about it, it's like, it's, it's not conducive, it's, it's not normal. And so if they could just open up the box and all of a sudden load and talk to it, that's, it's, it's an amazing kind of experience. Just the unraveling yeah. of that is, is an amazing experience. Yeah, so, yeah, the connectivity that, <clears throat> you know, um, yeah. Lu Lucy, in your experience it did, like, you know, it, it, in all the people you've talked to, you know, is the concern about the data leaving the device and where is it stored and who's it going to like is that real is it real in the eyes of the companies and then the parents and the schools and things like that in your experience? I believe it is yes I mean I think that it's not necessarily 100% rational 
um, when you actually ask people. So I one of the things I used to do a lot of was going and doing talks to parents on how to manage safety for kids and stuff um, and, and internet use. And actually one of the things I forced them to do in that was to break down what is it you're actually scared of. And I think that, um, and I'm a parent too, so I get yeah. it. Like as a parent, I, I spent a long time saying, no, no, we won't have Alexa, it's very dangerous. And then going, why, why am I, what is it I'm actually worried about? And, and actually people struggle to define that. So I, I do think that if you take it and it's in a box and you can absolutely 100% say no data is leaving that device, the confidence that will give a parent it might overcome the irrational i mean yeah. some of it isn't irrational i'm not saying that there's no and that's there fair no real data concerns out there yeah, but absolutely. i'm not sure a parent can separate in their head why they're worried which makes it very hard for you to address that specific concern because they didn't really know what it was but put yeah. it in a box seal the box and say it doesn't go to the internet yeah. there's a seal of there's a lock yeah yeah absolutely i think and that's something that. parents will get and therefore they'll be able to say yes i'm no longer worried um, yeah, I see a couple of years ago, technically it wasn't possible to do it at a price point that was interesting for the toy industry, for the app industry, for the game industry. It just wasn't, it wasn't possible on those chips because those chips were expensive yeah, to get absolutely. that working. But it is now, and that's where it's happened. So TJ, in your, in your experience, if, we, if, if it could be done at a price point that's attractive and it can be embedded or it's an SDK that works on a reasonably, not too old a phone, but something recent, does that change things? Will that break open? Will that will that catapult this forward? You know, I think so for sure because it just opens the door to be able. Again, obviously, as a price point is is going to be the key, and that is just going to open the door to to maybe companies that are, you know, have tech items out there but wouldn't necessarily play too broadly in tech, um, which which would be massive. Um, and also, I think it would be um, just a, a, a great, I'm so, I'm so distracted by the fact that it's absolute monsoon weather outside. <laughs> can, can, you, can you guys hear it? Not actually. Really. Like, the cancellation's like, doing a good job, don't worry. <laughs> good, good stuff. Um, yeah, no, it's literally just monsoon. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that having that contained experience would just mean the, the, the key thing is always with how well the, 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 the user it connects with the experience. And, and I, I agree with what Zay was saying there, where if you have a product and then you have your device, and I don't know, maybe if you can play with the product separate, what's the, what's the need for the device? If you can play with the, pro the product on the device separate, what's the need for that? Whereas if it's all in one package, it's all kind of a looped kind of play. So it's like, this enhances this rather than this requires this to work. I think yeah. that is kind yes. of what one package all enclosed could could do for for this space for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd love to ask you guys. This is this is a big you know the big the big thing here is that if we've solved accuracy, right? It actually works for kids like it does for adults, right? We don't have different different performance. If we've solved the privacy problem, we get all that done. The people are completely comfortable. In five years' time, like you know, what do you see in your industries? It looking like is voice everywhere is it still niche does it replace keyboard tap touch swipe does it you know is it more than you know doing a very narrow thing is it doing you know we, we used to call it in back in the name voice interaction so it, it was kind of human computer interaction through voice right because it's how humans interact you know do you see it as still being very niche or do you see it in kids' products widely? Um, TJ, if, if I'll go back to you. Uh, <laughs> and and yeah. maybe the, you can wrap up. This is this will be your kind of like, you know, how do you see this industry going? Because I, you know, as an invention studio, you're you're definitely in the it, it yeah, right for sure. in there. Um, I would say from again, from a, a an invention perspective, I think that there's always the temptation to look at what is successful and how it can be spun differently. And I think that as a as a um uh, looking at product that's already successful and integrating this tech and, and being being a company or, or you know a, an inventor that that wants to kind of create new experiences i think that that is something that's massively exciting and i, and I can only see with that kind of uh, growth in uh, quality and that growth in sort of mass market products i can only see inventors just delving into it more and more and more um, and interestingly, uh, what, what you guys have said as well about um, the availability of, of learning skills to, to be able to, 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 to create their own as an invention group, we would definitely be 
like massively uh, interested to be able to develop our own um, our own code for stuff and our own software because we do software for like tons of product that we work on anyway. But to be able to kind of add that voice tech as a as a new skill and be able to integrate and work with that would be massively appealing as an invention group. Um, so I, yeah, I think that inventors will only look at this product more and more as as it as it grows um uh, you know as a, as a as an industry uh, especially in toys when that kind of first product has has made it massively successful and hugely mass market and as lucy was saying that every kid must have i think yeah. inventors were going okay cool now we can do that for this 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 so yeah yeah, yeah can only see it you... in a growth um back to you lucy in education yeah. five years time how how integral do you think voice will be in five years? Getting everything right, getting all the Absolutely. components right, we're all happy. Yeah. Where do you see it? I, I mean, what I would really like to see, I think what's really exciting in education is that bringing that along with AI and the intelligence that AI can bring. You know, when you're looking at an education, what tech can bring to education, it can bring really personalized learning into an environment. And uh, to have that scaffolded by a, a voice and it's, doesn't replace a teacher i'm not saying teachers are disappearing but the fact that a child can um be taught be helped through in our case perhaps a creative process you can imagine helping and nudging and and coercing a child through a process in education that's personalized and voice driven is so much more natural you know when we're working in something where they're trying to do creative writing one of our biggest barriers is typing for kids because yeah. they simply don't type fast enough now if they can interact with voice in our area so that's anything literacy related the amount of opportunities are astronomic that's why i find this really exciting because i think yeah. you can open up the creative brain of a child without and separately help them learn to type and write and you know all those important skills but you don't have to wait until you can write well and type well to be able to develop those creative skills and, and other educational skills yeah. And that's that. actually very interesting. So that's, that's the pre -liter What can it do for the pre-literate child, yeah. or the or the fluent child, or the fluent writing, I, typing, yeah. and yeah, exactly. yeah. That's I sat next to a child and said and helped them do something creative and do it verbally, and they're absolutely brilliant at it at two or three yeah. years old. But you absolutely cannot do that until they can write normally. But you do that as yeah. a voice experience. So that's where I see this really taking off. I think it could, and I think that could make a fundamental difference to the educational quality for children and what they can do younger. I think it's really exciting space. No, that's actually a really good point about the age of the kids and what it can do. And I actually think that's applicable in toys and gaming and everything. We're often, and it's one of the reasons we do what we do at Soapbox is because we saw the fact that a child has a real hard time with a menu system button pressing, you know, you have to have a whole lot of VO to kind of, sh on, on amazing UX to get them to, and you can cut through all that when they can actually just express what yeah. they want. And, and that's, that, that's what we're doing. And yeah. Zay, and I'd love to, sorry, sorry go just on, TJ, on that yeah. as well. It's also the fact that, you know, if they're, if they're having to type something or spell something, they might not necessarily know how to spell or how to type or how to write, but to say it, they know the word they want to write. They just maybe don't yeah. know how to type it, how to search for it, or whatever it is for, for whatever reason they're using it. But saying it is just so yeah. easy. It's effortless. They know exactly what they're trying to get at. Yeah, because adults always do, we always think about our how we want to interact and then we can get ourselves straight and then we we ver we say it verbally where yeah. kids just blurt out something exactly. akin to what they want. And the computer must be able to respond, and that's that's the difference right yeah. um yeah. zay in, in your experience in the game in five years where do you see this do you see it everywhere or still niche oh i have a wild imagination being a creative so my what i see and a little bit of what we're working on right now it kind of contributes to that and hopefully uh other studios and uh companies will be conquering this as well is interactivity in movies and TV shows, like kid shows that you could actually talk to your, uh, you know, the main character and you could guide the main character into saying almost like a, a multiple or a choice where they could go into different rooms and you could have different endings. And so you feel as a child or an adult that you're making the story up. So it's kind of a different way of directing where mm -hmm. directing right now for film and TV is 
you're the audience, you're passive, and you're watching what an expert created. And hopefully you are, you know, in the story. But the other way around it is having a director telling a story for you to create, giving you the elements and the tools so you use your voice to create your own story and your own ending. And so I think that is the future. It's, it's gamification, gamification, but telling in uh, stories. And yeah. so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, you know, I, I want that for my kids. I have two daughters, three and seven. And I feel like, you know, they're, they're very passionate and they get attached to a character and to have that character come to life in a teddy bear or on uh, a figure and also on the TV screen and be able to guide you through and have that character next to them and have that character talk while mm. you're watching or sing along when it does a song, like those things, like I love to break the imagination there and, and break that, you know, what that screen can do because most of the things that we're creating are off screen, but if we could get to that place, yeah. then I feel like it's useful because then you could add learning curves to it. You could add all this beautiful stuff to it. So yeah, I, I very, want to be very natural. I, I'm looking forward to you building that. <laughs> I'll be, I'm waiting for you to build that. <laughs> no, thank you all very thank much you. for your time. Thanks for everybody joining online for this conversation. It's been a real treat. So um, thank you.